Hello, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are, and welcome to Books and Beer live. We're live again, which is great. It's, it's nice to be here live with you. And joining me, as advertised, as promised, Andrew Warren. How are you, mate? Hey, I'm great. Thank you for having me back. It's good to see you. I was just thinking while well, we were just saying it's it's it must be almost a year since we spoke last time and it's yeah it's always nice to reconnect with with people after a period of time to sort of talk about what's going on and what's new and all those sorts of things. Things are always changing so. Absolutely yeah absolutely I'm going to crack straight onto my beer because it's five o'clock here in the UK so <laughs> I, I feel like I feel like that's that's appropriate it's it's a British beer itself from the um from the St. Austell Brewery, which I think is Cornish, actually. Um, nice. Tribune, oh, Tribute Pale Ale. Yeah, it is. I love the colour of the label. Uh, I think they're from Cornwall. Um, yes, Cornwall. There we are. St. Austell in Cornwall. So, yeah, I'll be having that. You're on a coffee, you said. It's 9 a.m. for me, so I will uh, <laughs> substitute the beer with a different kind of brew, and uh, I'm drinking some black uh, hazelnut coffee. Hazelnut coffee. Interesting. Mm. Yeah. How many coffees do you have a day? Oh, too many. Uh, <laughs> uh, usually, usually four. But today um, I made six because I just felt I was going to need the extra little kick. So I you think make them in the morning. Yeah. Them in the morning. How does that? Yeah. Don't they go cold or do you, is it, do you not mind them? Hard I just cold? microwave it. And I just heat it up if it goes cold. I mean, oh. to be honest, I drink the first three pretty quickly. So it uh, doesn't have too but, long. Uh, are they like an espresso size? Or, oh, no, or... it's just a regular coffee machine where it fills the carafe, you know, and I just yeah. pour it as I go throughout the day. So. Gosh, and is that that's because you're working from home today or will you, will you be off yeah. out? No, yeah. yeah, I'm working from home today. Um, so, and, and I don't know if you remember, but last time I was on, you actually caught me on my very first coffee, which was where I blend it with protein powder. Yes, sort of I do. Unusual. So I'm still doing that, but this is my second coffee. So this is just black coffee instead. I see. I see. So last time we spoke, you were also doing some work away from writing novels. You were right. You were writing for was it was it writing for a film company or a TV company or something uh, like I, this? Well, I remember wrote, correctly. I was doing a couple of things. I wrote a few screenplays that had been optioned, and those are still out there. You know, it's a it's a crazy business film. And so when you <laughs> screenplay is optioned, that means someone gives you you know either a very small amount of money or no money depending on what kind of deal you make and they have the right to then shop that screenplay around for a certain amount of time and try to attach you know directors and actors and see if they can make it happen you know so a producer will option a screenplay from a writer usually the options maybe six months or a year or something like that um so my screenplays they have attached directors so that's good um so we'll just have to see. You know, it's uh, I'd say now there's a 10 percent chance they'll be made instead of a zero percent chance. So it's a very uh, yeah. tough business. But, you know, it's another form of writing that I enjoy. So it's you know, I'm not that is fascinating. Thinking. Are these screenplays based on books that exist or are they completely out of the, the folds of your mind? You know, have you invented them? Yeah, they're completely different stories. They have nothing to do with my books, although yeah. one of them uh one of them, actually, I really like the story, and I'm planning this year to adapt it into a book. It started as okay. a screen, but I, I want to turn it into a book. It's in the horror genre, and I think it would be a really, just a really fun, tight, you know, action-packed yeah. horror novel. So I'm planning, that's on my list of things to get to this year. That must be a fascinating sort of comparison from from make it, writing it in that screenplay form where it's very limited on the word count isn't it because you're just talking dialogue and stage yeah. direction i imagine yeah. um then going into a full 80,000 60,000 word novel whatever length you're Yeah i've never at. done it i've never i mean i've written many screenplays but i've never tried to take one into a book form so it's it'll be a first for me so i'm curious to see how that goes but it's a story where about half the story sort of takes place in the character's head and half of it is out in the real world. So I think it'll translate pretty well, you know, to a novel format. Yeah, brilliant. And you mentioned that one sort of a horror in the horror genre. It, mm -hmm. Do you, is that unusual for your screenplays? Or have they, have they got, have they got links with your, with your thrillers? Cause your thrillers are quite straight down the line thrillers from the one I've read. Yeah. Quite, no, you know, they're, funny. I, it's weird. I, you know, I, I, uh, I like lots of different genres and lots of different mm. kinds of writing. And although most of my novels, in fact, all of my novels are they fall into two. There's some sci-fi novels, but they're very sort of 
high action Star Wars space opera sci-fi. They're not, you know, very hard sci-fi at all. And then the thrillers. So both of which are kind of focused on action, but almost all of my screenplays have been horror. And mm. I think, uh, you know, I think I just like to funnel different aspects of myself into different mediums, you know? Yeah. I think that's an interesting idea. Um, I wonder whether they're, whether they're easier to be made or more likely to be made in one way or another, or whether that's a, an idea of yours is thinking, you know, shooting a shooting a sort of thriller. You know, imagine one of our books to be made into a film or TV program would cost a lot of money, wouldn't it? Because they're, they're yeah, international well, they're, settings, they're, they involve, you know, skyscrapers yeah, exactly. and helicopters and all sorts. <laughs> there are producers who have optioned my Thomas Kane books and they're out there. Really? Trying, yeah, they're trying to get it made. But like you said, I mean, it's that's not a thing... There's only a few places where you can take something like that because it would need a lot of money and you have to attach a big star. So they've been working at it for a couple of years now. And, you know, fingers crossed, but we're not there yeah. yet. Will, will you write the screenplay to that, do you think? Or would they get someone else I, involved? I didn't write the initial screenplay. They have another uh, writer that they had to do the pilot screenplay because at the time that they were uh, wanted to option, I, I was very busy. I was I was right in the middle of another cane book and i was doing some other stuff in the tv industry separate so i didn't have time to do it so they had another person do the screenplay and they did a good job i like what they did with it but you know down the road maybe we'll see yeah yeah that must be i feel like it would be really hard to you know because a screenplay and a book are very different you have to do things differently you have to change things to make it work in that new format and i think that would be hard for me because i'm so married you know i know the book so intimately that would be tough, but it would be interesting. Yeah. It, it must be also interesting to see someone else write your characters. That yeah. You, that very, you've... Very, it yeah. Was a very strange experience. I did try to, you know, I had to kind of step back and let them do their own thing. I gave them a couple, you know, maybe like <laughs> four notes. I, I really didn't want to be like too overbearing with it. And I wanted them to have the freedom to inject their own style into it. But I gave yeah. them like maybe three or four notes where, no, nah, I don't think Kane would do that, you know, and, and they, they were good and they changed you know, the things I asked and but that was about it. I tried to, to keep keep a hand's length away, arm's length away from the project. Yeah, yeah, I think it, I think that must be a challenge. It must be an interesting one. We'll just say hello. Um, Alison's dropped a hi in the comments. Hi, Alison. It is working, which is great to see. For the first, for the only the second time, in fact, I'm, we're just broadcasting. I was saying to Andrew before we went live, we're just broadcasting on YouTube today, not on Facebook. I want to see if it makes a difference to having everyone's comments in the same bar and all of the chats together and everyone watching on the same on the same stream. So um, we will see. But anyway, you should all be able to see each other in the comments when you're when when you're when you're jumping in there. But yeah, that sounds it's it's a fascinating world that you live in, Andrew. The idea of writing yeah. for, for for film and TV always sort of appeals to me. Always interests me. I, I'd say I've not I done anything about it or thought about it any more than an abstract sense at this stage. But it's interesting because it is a a, a very different way you know of expressing yourself. Things that work in a novel don't necessarily work in a, a movie, and vice versa. But sometimes there can be crossover because I know I remember when I wrote uh, uh, the very first Kane book, Tokyo Black. One of the things I wanted to do was I wanted to include a very cinematic uh, car chase. Because you know, I, I read that, oh, you can't do a car chase in a book. It doesn't translate, you know. But I, like, I don't know. I think, I think you could do yeah. it. So that was <laughs> one of my goals to kind of take something from this medium and put it into this medium and see if it would work. And you know, I, I was happy with the results. I think my readers are. So I, there, I think there's more crossover than people think, but there's still different beasts with different needs. Yeah, I think they are. And I think because we're in an era now where people watch TV more than they read, in many cases, yeah. or at least they watch TV before they read. So when, when you're growing up as a young adult, you'll have seen a car chase on a film. And then yeah. when you come to read about it, you could just, you can be quite scant with your details as a writer because the, the reader knows what a car chase yeah. looks like, yeah. don't they? They know what sparks look like or flames or, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Bits of door falling off and going all over the road. You know, they've got that in their mind already. You're just sort of connecting the dots in, in what you write. Definitely. Which, yeah, it's in, an interesting sort of idea. So let's talk about your new Kane novel then. This is the the fourth or fifth you you um, said, depending on how you look at the series. <laughs> yeah, I, I did a little bit of reorganization. Um, so the the prequel novella, which is like what I give away free if you sign up, you know, to my reader list. That I, I wanted to make you know, and Amazon's kind of funny the way they number things, and they don't really let you do a book zero. Mm. I mean, they sort of do. 
but then it won't show up with the other books in the series, you know, if, if you're looking at the series page. So, you know, I was always kind of, I'm not sure how I want, what do I call this? Is it book one? Cause I wrote Tokyo Black first and then mm. I wrote Devil's Due, but Devil's Due takes place before Tokyo is Black. And I tried putting it into a different series, like a series of shorter books, but I, I would get tons of emails with readers being confused about what order, you know, they should read in. So I reorganized it and I finally made Devil's Due just book number one. So by that counting, Code Green would be book number five, but it's the fourth full length novel in the series. Very nice. Very nice. And where is this one set then? And, and what does Thomas it's... Kane sort of come up against? <laughs> so this one is primarily set in Vietnam, although there is a, uh, a chunk of action that takes place in Singapore as well. And actually a very tiny bit in uh, Eastern Europe and Czechoslovakia. Oh wow! So he does a lot of a lot of traveling around. Well, it's not all it's not all him. So you know, uh, he's in primarily in Singapore and Vietnam, and then Rebecca, who is his boss at the CIA, she is in Prague, uh, oh. Czechoslovakia. And so the there's a little bit of action with her, but it's primarily Vietnam is the big I'd say overall setting for the book. Fantastic. What a great place to set a book as well. It's one of those places I long to to revisit. Perhaps even this year, I'd like to be able to make it out. There. Oh, that, what, yeah. I would love to go back. You know, it's, yeah. It's, it made an impression on me. I mean, by the time I went to Vietnam, I was already writing the cane book. So, of course, I knew when I went, you know, oh, this could be a good location for a cane book. But I was still blown away by the, I mean, it's such a beautiful country with the, you know, the history is fascinating. The, mm food is amazing the people are wonderful i mean i really enjoyed my time there absolutely when was that then that you went uh it's got to be i don't know maybe two or three years ago at this point i'm gonna say three years ago um because it mm. did I think it took about a year from when i finished code green before it came out so it's probably about three years ago yeah uh, yeah because, uh, i remember very clearly um when i was walk in hanoi when i was walking around the lake in the center of town yeah it was on the weekend and so the the street they close off the streets around that lake for like you know a street festival every weekend and uh, you know all the, the food sellers and vendors set up booths and there's music and everyone's out walking and uh my my then girlfriend and i were walking around the lake and i kept hearing this noise it was like a crack 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 like sticks cracking together like echoing you know i couldn't tell where it was coming from and I, I didn't know what it was and I, it was almost like a, a metronome beat you know as we were walking around and then finally I uh we came to this clearing where the crowd had parted and the noise was from these kids playing a game in the street with these sticks where they would like bang there were like two rows of older children and they bang these sticks on the pavement and then when they stop these little kids try to like hop through the gaps in the sticks and then they close the sticks together and then they do it again and you have to get your way through this thing. And I, 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 you know, I, I know I have to use this in a book. Like this is amazing. Cause it just gave such an atmosphere, you know, to the yeah. whole thing, a noise, that constant noise. So I, I as soon as I saw that, I, the, the whole, I mean, it was only one scene, but you know, sometimes that one scene is like the, your key to the story. And I just kind of saw the whole book unfold at that point. So I was, uh, I was very excited when I finally got to write it down. Oh, I totally, totally understand. I totally sort of hear that. How do you then, because this is something I wouldn't say struggle with, but something I find difficult is balancing that sort of detail along with the action of the story, because both are absolutely important, but mm. I'm not, I think people read our books to to be taken away into a story regardless of it being set in a really cool place don't they uh, sure. so it's really it's really hard i find to get that balance right isn't it uh, yeah i mean i think for me for so for that instance you know when i'm when i'm hearing it and i'm thinking well what does this kind of what kind of action does this detail support you know or what does it enhance and to me i i immediately pictured it's not a really a big action scene it's more of a slow stalking yeah. scene, you know like I mean, because like I said, it kind of felt like a metronome, you know, like a crack, 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 crack. And I just almost like if it were a movie, and this is where my cinema side comes in, like that would be the soundtrack. You know, there'd be no music. It would just be this beat of these sticks. And uh, and I just pictured Kane realizing that he's being followed. And so he has to, he can't, you know, make any obvious movements that, sh you know, he doesn't want to reveal it because they're both trying to find this person that's somewhere mm -hmm. around the lake 
realizes that he's being followed, so he doesn't want to let them know because he doesn't want to put the person he's trying to find at risk, but he also has to deal with this pursuer. And so it's more of a kind of a suspense scene, you know, a tension scene. And, uh, and I just, I essentially outlined the path that we took, you know, around the lake. And then we want, there's a bridge that goes off onto this little island. I would know it exactly. Yeah. He, you know, he's, he sees the kids playing the game and he realizes what the sound is, but then he realizes he's being followed and he goes across this bridge. And then finally, when he's a little bit farther away and he's on this island in the middle of the lake where you can get some privacy, then it becomes an action scene where he, he surprises this guy that's following him and takes him down. So it, I think you just, I don't know, for me, I just try to, it's true. It's always a balance, you know, because you have so much local color and detail that you want to mm. put in. And you don't want to overload the reader. So it's just... I, I try to find those three or four little details that make the scene come alive. And I try to find things besides, obviously sight is important, but I try to find those things that sounds and smells and textures yeah. that you don't experience as much in books because I find those details can make more of an impression. You, yeah. You know, get that right cocktail. So to me, that sound, as soon as I heard that sound, that was golden. Cause I'm like, Oh, this, you know, this is perfect. Like I can, I can pace the whole scene around the cracking of these sticks, you know. I think also um, sound and smell is more difficult to replicate if you haven't been to a place. Yeah. Um, so I think if you have been there, it's really something to show off, isn't it? Smell of the, the incense from the temple or the cooking yeah. or the whatever. Or even, you know, you get people... Uh, repairing cars on uh, you know outside their little car shops and the smell of the 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 whatever tools they're using or whatever chemicals they're using to do that you oh, know definitely. and those sorts of things I find so so enthralling when I read when I read sort of books like that how do you go about then whilst you're there and you're walking around for an example Hanoi um are you already thinking about that scene that you've described or does that come later you know are you already are you already th- and, and 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 then further to that, how do you record that to to come back to it when you're writing back in your office at home? Um, well, I, you know, I think in that, I, I don't know if every instance is the same. In that instance, I very clearly envisioned the scene that I ended up writing, just because I think the 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 that beat of those sticks kind of put me in that headspace. Yeah. Like, okay, like I'm Kane. I'm walking around this lake. There's this constant rhythmic beat of these sticks and so that scene just kind of came to me while i was there but i think uh you know normally that doesn't always happen a lot of times just certain details stand out and i don't honestly i don't tend to write them down it's just the things that stick in my head stick in my head like for instance when i first went to uh japan um one detail that just really stuck out to me was that when you would get into a taxi cab the doors open automatically you know, they have that, those little door openers. Yeah, and I was yeah. just by that. And so it, it wasn't a big detail, but when I wrote Tokyo Black, I included that detail, you know, just little things like that. Um, so I think the details that fascinate me just naturally stick in my head. And then it's either, they either suggest a scene while I'm there or they're just sort of floating around in my head. And then when I go go back to write, I'm, I they kind of bubble up and get included somehow into the scene. Yeah. Did you go to Hanoi then thinking it would be the setting of the book or did the book occur to you? I did. By the time, yeah, by the time I went to Vietnam, I knew that, uh, you know, I was, I was, I'd already written the first three Kane books at that point. So I knew I would set up, you know, I, well, I strongly suspected. I mean, I, you know, I, I, the books tend to focus on East Asian and Southeast Asian locations and, you know, Vietnam I knew would be a potential, you know, a, a country I was interested in writing about. Um, but I didn't necessarily know. I mean, we went to uh, you know, Ho Chi Minh City and uh, the Mekong Delta and Hanoi. So I didn't know which area I would necessarily focus the action on. But um, I, Hanoi really stood out for me. So I did focus a large chunk of it there after being there and seeing it all. Yeah, it's a fascinating place. Those little winding streets and the, the yeah. markets. And oh, it's 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 got a lot more sort of it feels more sort of ancient than the other cities like Ho Chi Minh is very, very much like Bangkok, isn't it? Skyscrapers and and that sort of thing, you know? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, when we were in Hanoi, I remember one night we were out, it rained 
and uh, you know, I was just I took a, I took a picture like of you know the, the that neon sign over the the main street where they have the night market, and there was like yeah. a, you know with the, the the straw hat with a fruit cart and this neon sign. It was raining. I mean, it's very noirish, you know. It yeah, has a very yeah. noir quality. And I mean, I think if you just look at that picture, it might be on my Instagram. I'm not sure, but that clearly I think suggests you know the mood I was going for with that book. So I love it. I love it. So do you? How how much do you use sort of local characters within your books then? Because I sometimes find, I've, I try to, but mm-hmm. often it is, it is it adds another layer of complexity, doesn't it, to put to 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 add sort of local characters in there? Because whilst we of course go there and meet as many local people as we possibly can as as travellers and tourists, mm-hmm. there that we have only been there for a week or a few days, yeah. you know, it, yeah. it, it, there is a it is difficult to do that, isn't it? And how how do you go <laughs> around that? I mean, I definitely, most of, I would say all of the books involve some local characters for sure. Code Green uh, is the first one, I think. Yeah, I think it's the first one where it doesn't involve a, a villain, you know, from that region. You know, so yeah. like in Tokyo Black, I mean, most of my books have a sort of dual villains. There's usually a corrupt element within the CIA working with a local, you know, wherever King uh-huh. is. I tend to... I mean, that's just sort of the way the story unfolded. Um, in, you know, I originally intended the books to be very standalone, but there did become this uh, kind of through line of this corrupt, like deep state conspiracy within the CIA. And that that just kind of became a part of each book. So there were yeah. usually two ones, a local villain in the US and a villain wherever it came was, and they were working together in some way. Uh, this is the, the first book where that didn't really, there wasn't really like a local villainous character, just because the story the way it unfolded, there was this other character from Kane's past, like someone that used to be part of his unit that had come back. And he just seemed to me to be where the focus should be on the villain. And, you know, I had several outlines where there was a local villain and it was never quite clicking. And so finally I just dropped that aspect of it and just focused. It's these two guys, they're both in Vietnam. They're both after the same thing. And it's almost more like a MacGuffin hunt, you know, between these two characters in, in, in Vietnam. Um, but there is a, a, a Vietnamese local character that kind of helps Kane and assists him that gets wrapped up in his story, you know, that, along the way. So, yeah, I, I I love the idea of that. In fact, I remember reading your Tokyo Black, and it opens in Thailand, I think, if I remember correctly. It was quite some time since I've yeah, actually, read I it. mean, the very first scene is in Japan, but Kane is in Thailand when it begins. Yeah, and he's in some sort of sweaty nightclub, and I just remember. I just remember because I think there's there's like a if I'm remembering right he's he's on like a balcony overlooking the nightclub and some shady yeah. deals going off or whatever and I, it, it was just like I've been to places like that I recognize <laughs> that sort of place straight away oh. you know what I mean like that, that those cold yeah. beers and the smell that you know like it was so I, visceral. Was great. I was watching a documentary actually about uh uh, prostitution in Thailand and they showed this nightclub which was it wasn't in I don't think it was in uh, Cairns in Pattaya I don't think this nightclub was in Pattaya but but it was a very visual you know it's like all glass windows and the girls have these like laser pointers that they're flashing around and I just visually it was like oh that's the kind of place I picture and so I just took that and made up a fictional nightclub using that as a kind of template you know yeah which, it was a lot of times you know I like, I mean, we all, and we both like to travel and I know we both like to incorporate, um, you know, our experiences in our books, but obviously you can't go everywhere and see everything. Yeah. So I, you shouldn't be afraid to, you know, you can create things and make up things that, that seem to fit as long as you're trying to keep it kind of in with the local color and experiences that you have had. You know, I think that gives you a baseline and I, I try, you know, if I need something else that I have to invent from there, I think that's fine. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think if you if you went totally to the letter of the place, you would you just it would just be too complicated, wouldn't it? You know, you'd be yeah. thinking, oh well, that restaurant doesn't open on a Tuesday, and this thing's happening on a Tuesday, so it couldn't, it wouldn't, you know, like <laughs> yeah, yeah, you've just got to. <laughs> I realized that I was writing Devil's Beer, which is set in Thailand, and he goes north, you know, to Chiang Mai, and then to then the next scene, he's supposed to be at a river. I remember. You know, I was looking at all of these maps of Thailand and trying to figure out, well, where would there be a river and like what river would it be and what would he have to go? How long would it? I mean, I was really like banging my head against the wall because I don't 
not an expert in Thailand at all. You know? yeah. And so finally one day I realized like, you know, what does it matter? Like I don't have to say where he went. Like he just goes into the jungle and there's a river, you know, it's like, he, yeah. I'm sure there's a river somewhere, you know? So it's like, wherever that is, that's where he went. And that was kind of <laughs> a big moment for me when I realized that, you know, the audience doesn't necessarily need a, you know, latitude by longitude travel on where people are going. You just have to make it believable. So I also think um, that there is something nice when you're a reader and you notice something that isn't quite true because it makes you feel a little bit smug, doesn't it? You're like, oh, oh, oh hold on a minute. I, I know <laughs> that's not quite right. The river goes from north to south in that, yeah. flows from north to south in that area, you know, or whatever, you know, some tiny little detail. <laughs> I think too, I think once you, as a writer, when you've done that, you start to realize like when you're reading a book and there's a lot of detail, then all of a sudden there's an area without much detail. Like, okay, this is where he just had to make it up because you know, he couldn't need it. No, he couldn't find it. You can kind of start to pick out like when they're, when they're relaying at factual details and when they're inventing stuff. But at, at the end of the day, it's all in service of the story to me. I, I, I love bringing locations to life, but that's not the primary thing that I'm doing. Yeah. What I'm really doing is entertaining the reader with the story. And for me, the, the details of the location are their their whole purpose is to immerse the reader into the story and let them feel like they're they're there, you know, let them shut out the outside world. So as long as I accomplish that, I don't mind, you know, making up some things here and there. Do you think though it is more difficult because most of our readers will not have been to some places we've you know, I get a handful of readers saying, Oh, you really bought Kathmandu to life, you really bought Hong Kong to life, etc most people won't have been to all of the places I've write, written about. They might be to been to one or two, you know, but they won't yeah. have been to all of them. <laughs> Do you think we make it more difficult for ourselves by picking those places then, as opposed to picking a place like LA that you know back to front? You know, you mm. walk those streets or drive down those streets every day, you know? <laughs> you know what? I'll tell you what, I don't know, but I do think... For the next Kane book, I plan to have it set in the US, like almost okay. entirely. So I guess I'll find out, right? Because that'll be, yeah. a, it'll be a much more familiar locale. But, uh, you know, I think you just have to, I think it just comes down to what interests you and what excites you, mm -hmm. you know, and what, what kinds of stories do you gravitate to? I mean, I, I, I think we talked before, you know, when I was a little kid, I remember reading um, all my dad's old James Bond books, you know, the Ian Fleming books. And his ability to kind of not only, you know, take me to a foreign place, but even a, a different time, you know, because he's writing yeah. in the 50s, really stuck with me, you know, and so that's just kind of what I enjoy. But if there's probably other writers that enjoy writing like things that are super familiar, like, you know, getting the nuances of everyday life and looking at them in a different way. I'm a big fan of the books of uh, Haruki Murakami, who is a okay. Japanese writer, and he writes all his books are set in Japan. So for him, he's writing about, you know, what's very familiar to him, but in these very like little details about, you know, the food his characters eat and cooking a meal and, you know, the going to a bar and it's not, you know, to him, that's just his everyday life. Uh, but he communicates it in such a fascinating way that I find it really interesting. So I think it just depends on what excites you as a writer. Yeah. I absolutely think you're right there. What city will you choose then? What part of the U S will you, Will you base I mean, it? You it might be, uh, move around. It won't just be one city. I, I haven't decided yet if LA will factor in or not. It might, but it, it's uh, he's basically um, tracking down a domestic terror group. So I'm thinking maybe the Pacific Northwest, which I think is a very kind of beautiful, rugged countryside. You know, maybe some echoes of Rambo in there a little bit. You know, mm -hmm. like uh, vibe. You know, like forests and mist. Yeah, and fog. That <laughs> Oh, fantastic. I look forward to that. So talk us through then the process that you have. And we may have touched on this last time, but I, I can't remember specifically. And I'm sure people watching at home won't mind if, if they if they do remember. But how do you take then sort of a nebulous idea like the one you've got at the moment or like the one you had when you're walking around that lake in, in Hanoi and right. develop that into that finished book of, you know, of, of however many thousand words you end up with? My So I do outline, although I've found that the more I write, the less I outline. I mean, I do still outline, but like my early outlines from my first couple books are very detailed, you know, like every scene, very detailed to me. I mean, maybe there's someone else that, you know, I, I've never written like, you know, a 30 page outline that, you know, I know some people do, but 
but I did write outlines where, you know, every single scene has a little, you know, description. Usually it's like a spreadsheet. Um, and I find now my outlines have a lot more holes in them. You know, like there'll be, you know, a couple scenes and then blank, 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 and then a couple more scenes, blank, blank, uh -huh. blank. Uh -huh. um, because I think the more you do it, the more you just kind of get a sense of, okay, I know I can figure that stuff out. You know, I, I don't have to worry about that. And, oh, I know I've got to get him here and I'll, I'll put in a fight scene here. Like you kind of start to develop your own style and rhythm. Um, but I do still outline as much as I can, you know, yeah. just so that's some kind of signpost for where the book is heading. So usually what happens is I get a, a general idea and then I just start thinking of uh, scenes. Like I use index cards and I'll write, I'll write like one scene per card, you know? And so maybe like, who knows if this, so like for the, the Vietnam book, you know, maybe I had that idea for a scene uh, stalking someone around the lake. So I write, you know, stalking around the lake, uh, you know, sticks hitting ground. And then, the, you know, you might, okay, well, I also, I, I knew for that one, I also wanted a scene in Singapore, you know, in the Singapore, the Marina Bay Hotel, in Singapore, so I write, you know, chase through Hotel Singapore. And then you just start thinking, well, okay, like, what is he, why is he stalking around the lake? You know, he's looking for someone. Well, who's he looking for? Well, he, he found some information in the hotel in Singapore that lead, led him here, you know. You just start to fill in those missing pieces and write them down, and I find once I've got about 20 or 30 scenes like that, that then I take the cards, start looking through them, and then I start making a spreadsheet. You know, I usually do kind of an arbitrary number. I'll say like one through 40, because yeah. most, of, most of my books have somewhere between 30 to 50 chapters. You know, so 40 is like right in the middle there. And then I just start writing them down um, in order and see where the blanks are. Like, well, okay, if he's here, you know, these three scenes are in Singapore and then he's in Vietnam. So there's gotta be something where he gets from there to here. And I just start looking at the holes and trying to fill them in, you know, as much as I can. And like I said, you know, I, my original outlines, like I wouldn't start writing until everything was filled in, but now yeah. I'm okay with some gaps, you know, as long as, as long as I know, you know, what the villain wants, what the resolution is going to be. Not necessarily the ending. A lot of people say don't start writing until you know the ending. For me, I need to know like, how's it going to turn out? You know, like, like is Kane going to get what he wants? Is he going to get what he wants, but he's left with this other problem? You know, how does it affect him personally? I, that's what I need to know. But how the climax will play out, I don't I can see where the, the writing takes me and I can get to that when I get to that. Yeah, I think that's a, that's that's quite a detailed way of doing it then like i, I know you're you're one end of the, the plotting spectrum then doing it in card and especially and knowing most of the story as you said you do leave some parts out you know but but i know other people that write way more detailed outlines you know that write like i said like 30 page you know treatments where it's almost like a short story of yeah. the whole book which to yeah. me that's very like that's too much detail for me you know my outlines are two or three pages you know it's just like i said a couple sentences about each scene and, and i'm good to go and, and like like i said i now find myself skipping a lot of scenes where i'm like well i don't know i'll figure it out when i get there you know but but i'll have i'll have at least half of them you know filled in so that's it and you do always figure th things always change in my experience on the way in in the during the writing process <laughs> oh yeah when i wrote tokyo black if, if I look, go back and look at my outlines, it, it, it changed so much. And at one point, like almost every secondary character was going to die, you know, and like they all ended <laughs> up in the final book. You know? So it's uh, so so. Tokyo Black was the first Kane book you published. Um, uh, no, it was the first book I wrote. So I oh uh, yeah, wrote, that's what I was going to. Yeah, I actually published Devil's Do first. So I wrote Tokyo Black. I, that was my very first book, so I wanted to take a long time with editing. So I went through two different editors, two editorial passes. And while that was all going on, I wrote the novella Devil's Do. Mm. And I published that first because it was mm. a prequel. And I just thought it kind of made sense. And also, it was my first time self publishing. So I wanted to kind of, you know, just kind of figure out how it all worked with something a little bit smaller and, and less complex, you know, than a film novel. Had you written any books before that or any novels no, before that? No, Tokyo Black was the first. I'd started many books and never finished them. You know, I, I, I could never quite wrap my head around the structure of a novel versus the structure of a screenplay. I actually had come more from screenwriting. You know, I was a film mm. student in college. So I understood screenplay structure, but translating that to a novel, I just found difficult. And also, I, you know, I think I just wasn't, 
at a point where I could really focus enough, you know, I mean, you, just, you need a certain, I think, kind of, you could call it maturity or maybe just call it more of a boring life where you're not, so you're not doing as much, you know, where you have time to sit down and for a couple hours and write and you're not, uh, you know, trying to go out and pick up girls or date or go to bars or whatever at the same time. <laughs> Uh, you know, it was around, I think I was in my 40s, early 40s, mid 40s, I don't know, when I wrote Tokyo Black, and uh, everything just kind of clicked. Like, I finally had the time to sort of figure it out. And even then, it still took a couple years, you know, to get through that first book. But I just kept coming back to it. My my then fiance, now wife, uh, she read the first half of it. And she started asking me about it, like, well, what happens? Like, how? what happens to this character? And I'm like, I don't know. I haven't finished it, you know? <laughs> And so that kind of spurred me on to, to finish it up. And then I think once you, once you do it, then you sort of have your own process for doing it. You know, you kind of have to go through it to figure out how you'll do it, you know, and then the next one is a little easier. I think that's the same with so many things, isn't it? You've, yeah, that first, you that first yeah. time is always messy. It's always difficult, you know, <laughs> totally. and you just have to persevere through. In fact, Alison's asked a question, which I think you've just about answered, to be fair. How many unpublished, half-finished books do you have? I mean, yeah. were there were there any notable characters in your in your prior half-finished books that you never that you never finished? Or any I mean, were they all of a similar style, like thriller sort of style? Yeah. Or were you trying to do well, sci-fi dystopia books or whatever? Yeah, although, you know, it's interesting, I'd say most of my unfinished books oddly enough, were uh, horror. Like, I, I've always uh -huh. been a horror fan as well. In fact, when I told people I was publishing my first book, uh, a lot of my friends assumed it would be horror, you know, because they knew I loved horror movies and stuff. And I was like, oh, no, it's a, you know, it's more of a spy thriller. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I once saw um, the director, David Cronenberg, give a speech. And Cronenberg mostly does horror films, but he has this one weird film way at the beginning of his career that's called Fast Company. That's like a drag racing teen comedy you know and so like, <laughs> but someone at this uh talk at you know they raised their hand they asked him hey you know it, is it true that you made this funny drag racing teen comedy movie and Cronenberg said you know what it's yes I made that movie and I'm a huge uh, motorcycle racing fan and at the time even though that's very different from my body of work I was really fascinated in that racing world and so I made that movie and he said I could make you know, a thousand movies and that's never going to capture every piece of my personality. And you know, human beings are such complex you know, creatures. So, yeah, I mean, I think we all have many, many interests that we could maybe apply to our creative mm. endeavors. So most of the novels I tried to start were sort of horror related. Um, I don't know if that's why I didn't finish them. I don't think so. I think it was just because I just wasn't ready. You know, I just wasn't yeah. at that point where I could sit down one of them was a it was a very kind of jaws-esque tale about a giant alligator like in this new orleans town um one of them was and one of them was uh it was also a kind of monster story i don't remember but there was a a, a thai female character that is somewhat similar to uh one of the characters in devil's do so maybe that oh, right. you know carried over um so i'd say i probably have three or four half-finished manuscripts laying on a hard drive somewhere i would have to yeah up and, you know. <laughs> that may find their way probably find their way surreptitiously into another book at some point I'm or release sure. those characters yeah, will, will <laughs> and throw over ray offers a very good suggestion you need to retire like him although he still finds <laughs> there's not enough time to do everything that's because oh, you've set up your own business ray doing proofreading and editing and things like that i think you're busier than ever mate <laughs> right but it, it would be nice fingers crossed and that's my that's my hope <laughs> yeah yeah well that would be the dream do you think um i mean do you think you'll always write these thomas kane thrillers or have you got other sort of you spoke there about the 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 director who's got all these interests you know where would you go off to next would you would oh, you write a horror novel you know yeah in fact like i said i think this year one of my plans is uh to to take a horror screenplay I have and turn it into yeah. a novel. Oh, yes, of course you did. Yeah. But um, I think I'll write Kane as long as I find him interesting. You know, I mean, it's, yeah. it's tricky. And I know some people, some authors write, you know, maybe three books about a character and then they move on. Other authors write 20, you know, like are, are continuous until their death writing about one character. I don't know how long Kane will hold my interest, but I try to, I try to always 
not forget, you know, that he's a, a living, breathing character. And, you know, you don't want too much change. Like, I, I think when you start reading a book and the character has, like, made a massive life change off screen, I think that can kind of our readers. So I try to always keep certain things consistent, but there is kind of a through line through the books of him kind of maturing and overcoming this betrayal and trying to put his life back together. And I just try to take little small pieces of that and advance it a tiny bit each book so that it's not kind of blowing it all out at once. But, you know, we'll see. I, I, I could also see writing books about him maybe when he's a little older, you know, when he's retired and maybe slightly change things up. Maybe he can't quite, you know, kick ass like he does now, but he's still a tough old guy, you know, maybe more mystery based or something. Um, I'd like to do some books about, uh, there's a character in the second book, Red Phoenix, who I, I've always wanted to do a spin-off story about. I just haven't gotten to yet. Um, and I don't want to reveal who it is because I don't want to spoil the surprise. But <laughs> I'd like to maybe get to that someday. And, and then on top of that, I have a whole separate uh, science fiction series called Talon, which is right. much more uh, kind of Star Wars-y fantasy in space kind of thing, which I also enjoy writing. So, yeah, I mean, and, and that's just for now. I, I would hope you know, as I continue writing, who knows, you know, all new characters and worlds and ideas will, will come to me. Yeah, oh, that's, this is it, isn't it? There's so many ideas and the ideas aren't the difficult part often. It's the time to execute them correctly and the, the dedication, I, I suppose, to execute them correctly. Yeah, also, I, think, I, feel. I think finding the ideas that really resonate with you, you know, I think that's mm -hmm. tough. Like we all have tons of ideas, but maybe not all of them resonate with us in a way that it's going to keep you fascinated for three months or six months or whatever it takes or a year to write a book. So it's like figuring out of all those ideas, like which one, which even though I may be really excited about this idea, maybe this idea, it's, it might not attract as much attention, but when I really think about it, it, there's a more fascinating avenues I can go down with it. You know, like what is going to really click with you and keep you going? You know, I think that's actually, to me, that's the hardest part. Cause like, you know, you can have, a hundred ideas a day, but figuring out which idea you know, you want to go with, I think that's that can be tricky. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right, and I think you do have to pick carefully because, as as you say, yeah. you get started and you get halfway down that that track, and it it's it, it takes that dedication, doesn't it? Because even if you if you even if you're one of these people that can write quickly, you you know, it's still a a solid amount of hours working on that thing or yeah, sat in front of that thing. Right? I mean, you. You can only write, no matter how many books you can write, you can only write so many. You know, you can't write all of them that you might want to. So every book you pick, yeah, it's like you're, you're sort of like checking off on the checklist. All right, well, I got, you know, 20 left in me. Like now I got 18. I know. Yeah, this is it. And, and these ideas, I always go, oh, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that this year. And then yeah. it, it doesn't happen, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> things always take longer than you expect them to, don't they? They always go on for for longer <laughs> ray says um Probably. you need to check out alan baxter's crocopolis croc crocolips i mean alan was talking about this when i talked to him the other day it sounds like a great a great concept the title of my giant crocodile book was king croc with croc spelled with a k so it's kind of a king kong play but uh, nice. croc that's a fantastic uh title i'll, I'll definitely have <laughs> it down i love those uh that's another kind of weird niche that i like i love the sea creature horror books like you know draws and meg and you know a bunch of them like I, I find them very entertaining there are just niche upon niche upon niche of those sorts of books aren't there though which are which are fantastic and i think i think amazon and other booksellers are quite good at not showing you things that you're not interested in so you don't mm -hmm. realize there is, there is this other world of stuff it's not like an old bookstore when you would see it all there wouldn't you and you'd know how many books there were because you could see and you could quite easily go and explore the other areas they just don't they just don't show you don't the, the other stuff you know <laughs> to look for it you know and it's true now you know it's funny you say that because look i love amazon of course and it's amazing it's changed our lives you know for good and bad but I think back to that experience of wandering through a bookstore and just grabbing something that looks interesting. You know, I've found some of my favorite authors that mm. way, which is, probably doesn't happen as much now. Because like you said, Amazon's not just going to show you a random book. You know, it's, they're going to show you things like you've already bought or that they think you'll be interested in based on your profile. But Haruki Murakami, who's like one of my favorite writers, like I mentioned, I just happened to be in a bookstore, saw the book on a table, and I thought it looked interesting. You know, just yeah, I just grabbed it for really no reason. It was just a random 
thing. And he became one of my favorite authors. So that experience, I feel like probably doesn't happen as much anymore. That's right, isn't it? It's it, it's that sort of discover. The discovery process is different, certainly, very certainly good. very different. Yeah. I mean, I always, too. yeah, that's it. The same same sort of concept, isn't it? I always love discovering books in those in those old sort of dusty secondhand bookshops. Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> where you'd open I, the book and it would have like a someone had written for to Margaret's birthday, nineteen seventy two. You know, or whatever it was. You know. <laughs> My, when I was a little kid, my mother used to work for, I forget what it was. It was some charity, but they would throw a used book sale, you know, every year. And it would be a pretty big book sale. They'd rent a big, you know, warehouse or something. And it would just be full of books. And I would just go and wander around and you could grab these books for, you know, 10 cents a paperback. And I mean, it's amazing. I, I read so many books from that. That's where I discovered uh, Conan, the Conan books. Um, yeah. I, Howard, that's pro- I think that's where I got my first copy of Jaws. Um, lots of things there, you know, that. It's and that, that discovery, that organic discovery process of just wading through these stacks of musty old books and seeing what looks interesting. It's, a, it's it was a lot of fun. I also don't think there'll be the canonical books, if that's the right term. That that you know the books that everyone read. So like oh, a yeah. generation ago, the books that everyone read would have been I don't know the the, the best sellers of that time. I mean, I suppose they do still exist because you still have like um the the books that break through into the mainstream but there are you know those books that you can just talk to someone and you can say do you remember this character yeah of course i do yeah. i've absolutely read yeah. that book you know <laughs> now you know and, and a lot of the authors are the same i mean you know stephen king is still one of the top selling authors i, I think the the list of new people breaking in that is much smaller than it used to be yeah yeah absolutely but actually i think there's enough people that read books like yours and i you know aren't we're not we're not selling we're not we're not breaking into those sorts of realms but but still the books are being discovered and they're being shown to to good people so that that's something to be very happy with and very proud of i suppose sure. one thing one thing on code green that i was really surprised with is it's probably my fastest accumulation of reviews i think of any uh-huh. of my books it's only been out uh, about a a month and it's already had a, a, a 200 plus review wow that's fantastic faster than any of the other books got to that number so yeah that's incredible yeah maybe uh, you you can just speculate can't you that people are sort of reading had read up to the one before that over the years yeah. and have just been waiting you know <laughs> for that one to come out for all that time emails like when is it coming out what's going on you know like i'm trying i'm going as fast as i can so I, yeah I do, thankfully it's a good problem to have but luckily there were people waiting for it so did you do a pre-order for it i did i did a, a quite long pre-order actually almost a month because right. i mostly because i really wanted people to know it was coming finally you yeah. know like people have been waiting so long so i wanted to make sure everyone knew like yes it is coming it's finished you know you can pre-order it here's the cover you know, so yeah fantastic fantastic well i've i look forward to reading it i haven't yet unfortunately but i will do particularly now talking of your descriptions of hanoi they sound fantastic yeah another quick question from allison um i love getting these questions from people in the comments what's your favorite quote or word you use regularly and i'm going to add on to that to sort of get you through those dark times when (laughs) right when you're stuck in the middle of a story or a plan and and it just all seems like it's falling apart and isn't working quite as it should i have a quote uh, i use this quite a bit in fact it was even in my wedding vows this quote um oh wow the the perfect is the enemy of the good you know i think a lot of times when you're stuck you know and especially i think as writers right because we always have this vision in our head of what the book is going to be and it's always easier this is a this is a term from Hollywood. You know, it's easier to sell the sizzle than the steak. You know, it's always easier to imagine how great this is going to be and get people excited in a concept that doesn't even exist. But then once it exists, you're sort of stuck with all the problems and things you have to <laughs> fit. It may not live up to what you wanted it to be. It may have gone a totally different direction than you thought, or you may be stuck. You know, trying to finish in the middle. So I, I just 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 do the best you can at the point you're at. Move on. You know and Get to get to the end and then go back and fix as much as you can. But it's never nothing is ever perfect. Like perfection to me is a unattainable level. You know, I mean, if you set perfection at a level that's attainable, then you're probably kind of under undershooting. You know, like 
But I think uh, you just have to accept, you know, warts and all, like this is the book I've made as best as I can be. You put it out in the world and you move on to the next one. You know, it's nothing's perfect. The, some of my favorite books by my favorite authors have problems, you know, not, they're, they're not perfect or things that could be better. And I think I, the one thing we were talking about how it gets easier as you go, but I think the thing that gets harder, at least for me, is every book I write, I'm always like, I always, and my, my wife will corroborate this. I always, after I finish, I'm like, oh, this is the worst book I ever read. You know, like, <laughs> you know, like, well, you said that about the last three. So this one, one of them must not be, you know, like they can't all be the worst book ever. <laughs> when you do start building up a readership, you know, you don't want to let the readers down. You know, you want to, mm. you want you want each one to be better than the last. And I think you, you can, it's very easy to kind of go down that rabbit hole of imposter syndrome and, worrying that everything's not perfect but the reality is nothing's perfect so you just do the best you can get you know get through whatever problem you're at maybe maybe you can't come up with the best solution but you can always go back later you know just come up with something move keep it moving and you know just finish finishing is the most important thing no i agree with you completely and i i tell writers when they talk to me you know like new writers when they need some encouragement exactly the same thing you know get get the words down get the first yeah. draft finished and and i take that take that advice quite strongly myself you know because you, you're right you just need to get to the end don't you get to the end of the story and then you can start editing then you can start improving then you can start a brilliant like, getting it novel is worthless you know i mean it's there's nothing there it's not anything you know, so I'd rather have a good finished novel than a perfect, you know, three quarters of a manuscript. So. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And also, I think I, I also think keeping things simple is quite good. You know, you have all these ideas for really complicated twists and yeah. and and double bluffs and double crosses and all sorts of other things. And whilst those things are clever, actually, a, a great simple story is is a really good thing. Actually, <laughs> I think, you know, I think different writers are different. I think some writers are really into those twists or surprises or making things very different than what you expect. But, you know, personally, I've found I'm most comfortable, you know, telling a familiar story well and putting mm -hmm. my own stamp on it. You know, mm -hmm. that's kind of what I enjoy. I'm not really looking to, at least not with what I've written so far, you know, you never know, and a different book may feel different, but I, I, I'm not looking to reinvent the wheel. I kind of want to capture the feeling that the books I loved as a kid gave me. So, you know, I'm not really looking to deconstruct what made those stories work. I just want, I just want to entertain the reader, you know, like, and I agree. I think sometimes it's best to just keep it simple, you know, no, a good revenge story always works, you know, <laughs> or something basic like that. Just, you know, you put your own stamp on it, you put your own touches on it. And that's, to me, that's different enough. Mm. No, I exactly, I agree with you exactly. Those those things that, it's, that are different enough that, that just sort of take it to a new a new sort of realm and a new sort of level um, are really entertaining. Andrew, this has been absolutely fantastic. We, we're, we're coming up to an hour, so we'll, we'll begin to wrap up. We've got a couple of uh, comments that I'd like us to talk about. Uh, Ray talks unfortunately about these locally owned dusty old bookstores are quickly are failing quickly oh, uh, yes you're right you're, you're right and, and that is a shame isn't it those those sorts of places are are going under a bit more and we see less and less of them at the moment even the big bookstores i mean barnes and noble is perpetually struggling you know i mean i think like I said, for better or for worse, I think Amazon, look, I, I love Amazon. I, I sell my books on Amazon. I use it all the time, but yeah, it's undeniable yeah. that it's much harder for any brick and mortar store to compete with that. You know, I mean, it's uh, it's changed the landscape, just like Netflix has changed the landscape of movies. So. Mm, mm, mm. That, that's it, exactly. It's, as you say, there's good and bad with all of these sorts of things, and and I think you've got to you've got to sort of take the rough with the smooth and those, yeah, what and, and that sort of thing. But no, it's, it's it's fantastic. So where should people, if they've never seen your books before, Andrew, where should they go? And what book would you recommend them starting with to get involved in the Thomas Kane series? Well, um, if you go to my website, andrewwarrenbooks.com, uh, right at the top, there's a link you can click to get Devil's Due for free. And that is, uh, as I said, sort of the, the first chronological book in the series. And I think it's a good starting point and it's free. So, you know, why not? Give it a shot. See if you like it. Absolutely. What a great place to go. AndrewWarrenBooks.com. There you go. There you go. 
free books. Perfect. Who couldn't who couldn't want that? <laughs> Why would that be a bad thing? You'll yeah. know like if you book and you like it, you'll probably like the series. If you hate it, you know you can move on. Exactly. That's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of it. I'm sure people will love it. I know I did. Oh, I certainly I love I love Tokyo Black, which is the one I've read. Andrew, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me back. It's great to chat with you. It's been great. And I'm back, ladies and gents, listen at home. I am back with Mike, Mike Grist. I was going to say Mark Grist. No, Mike Grist um, next Wednesday to talk about his book, which I'm looking forward to. So have a great one. Thank you so much. And I will see you again very, very soon. See you later. Take care.